So hello again, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is our Navigating Mainstream Benefits training series for Santa Clara County, COC. Uh, today is day one of two for the training on SSI and SSDI. A quick intro for myself. My name is Max. I'm a senior staff attorney at Homebase. We're a technical assistance provider to the Santa Clara County, uh, excuse me, Continuum of Care. And uh, we provide technical assistance for COCs all across the nation. Uh, we work closely with Santa Clara County's Office of Supportive Housing. And one of the many things that we do in that scope is to bring you trainings like this on behalf of OSH, uh, including this Navigating Mainstream Benefits training series. And so uh, we are always looking to improve these trainings. Uh, near the end of the training today, we're going to pop a feedback form uh, that is specific to this training into the chat box. And uh, we really hope that you can take a second to fill that out uh, in the coming days. Really helps us tailor our trainings and make sure that we're getting you the content and the topic areas that you most want to learn about. Okay, so as I said, uh, today is day one of two of a two-part mini-series on Medicare, Medi-Cal, and the Covered California training. And this is sponsored by the Santa Clara County COC. Uh, day two of this training is going to take place on Thursday. That's September 28th from uh, 9 to 11 a.m. And uh, just like for this training, registration is going to be required via Zoom. Uh, if you registered for today's training, then you are all set to attend day two of this training next week. Uh, so please uh, take a look and make sure that this is on your calendar. And if not, please reach out to us. Uh, we'll be dropping a uh, uh, an email address in the chat box as well a little bit later. Okay, let's talk about Zoom housekeeping. Uh, in terms of tech, most of you are probably well familiar with Zoom by now. I do want to let you know that we are recording this training, which I just reminded myself to do. <laughs> Oh, no, it's already recording. All right. <laughs> My colleague Carla has thought of everything. Um, so in terms of tech, um, uh, uh, the training materials are going to be sent out. We are recording, and we are always going to be posting these trainings to the COC training website. So don't feel like you need to screenshot any of the slides as we go along. Um, we're going to keep everybody on mute by default, but there will be time at the end to ask questions by unmuting yourself. In the meantime, please feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat box. Uh, Rachel will be responding to them, uh, to as many of them as she can. And uh, if you have any tech issues, feel free to direct chat me. Uh, I'm more than happy to help you resolve those. And uh, just a heads up too that closed captions are available. So if you hit the closed captioning button, you should be able to see those pop up at the bottom of your screen. Okay, with all the logistics out of the way, uh, just a quick icebreaker introduction slide uh, so that we're all familiarized with the chat feature, especially. Uh, we're going to ask you to introduce yourself by chat and uh, share with us your name, your organization, and what you're looking forward to now that fall is almost here. Um, and uh, I'll go first, actually. I'll go ahead and drop my name in there. Uh, so I'm base, and I love a hot potty. All right. Um, so uh, while folks are warming up in the chat, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to our friends, our uh, wonderful guest speakers today, Asha and Rachel, to introduce themselves and begin our training. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Asha Albuquerque. Um, and I'm a staff attorney at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, and I'll pass it to Rachel. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Nino. I'm a supervising attorney here with the health program of the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, and as um, Max uh, mentioned, I'm going to be monitoring the chat and answering as many questions as I can throughout the presentation. And any other questions I will try to get to um, at the end. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today's presentation is about navigating mainstream um, benefits. Um, and so first, um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, so next slide. 
Um, so the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley is a nonprofit um, legal aid organization. Um, and we provide free legal services in specific um, subject areas. We have a health program where Rachel and I both work. Um, we also have a housing program um, that helps patients facing eviction and other housing legal issues. And then also we have a unit that focuses on legal services um, for children and youth. Um, and because um, this is a benefits presentation and Rachel and I are both in the health program, I can let you know a little bit more about what our specific group does. Um, so the health program focuses on providing legal services um, to individuals in Santa Clara County um, living with um, disabilities such as physical or mental health disabilities. We assist um, clients in a variety of practice areas um, if they qualify for services. Um, some of our services include um, patients' rights work, um, where we um, help clients who are on psychiatric holds or in inpatient psychiatric facilities in the county. Um, and we represent them in hearings um, while they're being detained. We also do a lot of work ensuring that mental health consumers have access to quality of care and mental health services. Um, our practice also does public benefits work, which is the focus of today's presentation. Our health program assists clients um, who are um, appealing public benefits denials, um, such as Social Security, um, as well as state and local benefit issues, such as Medi-Cal, General Assistance, and CalFresh, um, a variety of benefits funded either by the county or the state. Um, as we mentioned, um, today's focus is going to be on the, uh, the benefits related to Social Security, um, so benefits provided by the Social Security Administration. Um, but in addition, we also um, assist clients um, with issues about eligibility and receipt of benefits um, and some other services, which we won't go into today, but we help clients with federal student loan discharges um, and clients seeking affirmation of their name and gender and seeking help with the court forms involving that. Um, so that was just so you learned a little bit more about what the Law Foundation does. Um, next slide. Um, so now we're gonna give you a roadmap for today's presentation. Um, as was mentioned, today is day one of two trainings related to navigating mainstream benefits. Today's presentation is going to focus on a few different things. Uh, first, we'll look at the basic eligibility for Social Security benefits. Um, you'll learn what is required to um, be eligible for the SSDI program, um, as well as the SSI program. We'll learn the differences between SSI and SSDI um, and how um, clients can establish their disability for the purpose of receiving benefits. We'll also learn about some issues related to um, immigrant eligibility for both of these programs. And after we've talked about basic eligibility, then we'll learn more about the application process, um, what clients need to do to apply for these benefits, um, as some people might have questions about how the application works um, and what's the best way for um, people to get started with getting Social Security. We'll also learn about what happens after someone applies. Um, for instance, what the um, questionnaires entail um, we'll learn about um, consultative exams um, and the different processes um, involving um, applying for Social Security. Um, in addition, we'll learn about the appeal process. What happens when someone's been denied benefits? Um, what deadlines apply to appealing? Um, the certain forms or appeals um, related um, if someone wants to get benefits and has been denied. And then we'll wrap up today's presentation talking a little bit about continuing disability reviews. Um, continuing disability reviews are a process um, Social Security engages in once somebody is on benefits for a period of time 
and Social Security needs to review them to see if that person continues to be eligible for the benefits. Um, so that's the roadmap of what we'll cover. Um, and um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so on the next slide, um, we'll go over some more information. Um, so um, before we begin, um, Social Security has a lot of complex rules um, that are frustrating, confusing, and really hard to understand. It's a bureaucratic process, and it's confusing not just for lay people, but also for Social Security lawyers. Um, some of these rules are complex, things might change, um, different um, field offices have different interpretations. So it can be really hard for lay um, people or mental health consumers to navigate Social Security benefits. We want to stress that you don't have to memorize everything we're saying today. You'll get a copy of the slides and the recording, um, so you can refer to this in the future. Um, today's presentation is really intended to help you get a feel for Social Security law and Social Security benefits, including the application and eligibility process. So that when you're working with clients in the community, um, you'll be able to start learning how to issue SPOT, SPOT issues that come up when someone's applying for benefits or received it benefits and having issues with social security. Um, so um, when things come up later on, you can always just refer to the slide deck mm -hmm. um, or maybe when issues come up, you can refer those clients to the Law Foundation um, Health Program for um, some legal counsel and advice. Um, the bottom line is if your client gets a notice or a letter from social security, that they don't understand. Um, or maybe your client is just having some kind of problem with their social security payments. Um, Law Foundation is here to help. And you can always um, reach out to us, refer these clients um, so we can help them um, with their legal issues. Um, I know a lot of people have concerns and complaints about how difficult it is to communicate with social security. Um, you know, although that is kind of a systemic issue, we do have some workarounds and some abilities to contact Social Security and work with them through different methods. Um, so if you're having issues with that, that's also something you can reach out to us about or have a client reach out to us. Um, so next slide. And so let's talk now about the basic eligibility for Social Security benefits. Um, and so there are two types of Social Security benefits. Um, there's a SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, and that's also referred to as Title II um, benefits, if you've heard that term. Um, and then SSI, um, which stands for Supplemental Security Income. Um, and um, so SSI is also referred to as Title 16 as well. So um, both of these programs are managed by the Social Security Administration, uh, which is a federal um, government agency. Um, and both SSI and SSDI require the same finding of disability for a person to be entitled to either of those benefits. We'll talk about what that de definition of disability is in a few slides. But I think the first thing that you want to remember um, is that these two programs have um, this important similarity of both requiring the same finding of disability um, and that they're both managed by the same agency, the Social Security Administration. Um, and that when um, the, um, an SSDI is like an insurance program, where it requires a person has to have a sufficient amount of work history um, or time they worked um, to be insured. And we're gonna talk about how that work history um, is uh, built up or established in a little bit. But SSI is different from SSDI and SSI does not require work history. Um, and it's SSI is really a, a safety net program for clients um, who are too disabled to work and they don't have a work history that entitles them to SSDI. 
um, and they may be very low income and have very um, few assets. Um, so SSI has um, an income and asset limit for clients to be eligible for this program. Um, and so um, SSDI is um, covered through a patient being ins insured. So when someone is working, um, payroll taxes um, go into the SSDI program. So you might see that sometimes on your pay stub or your W-2 that a person has contributed a certain amount um, to this um, federal um, insurance contributions. Um, and that's why someone might be entitled to um, SSDI benefits if they're um, disabled or blind. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, Social Security Disability Insurance um, provides cash benefits to people who are disabled or blind and who are insured um, through contributions um, through payroll taxes. Um, and FICA is the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. Um, that's what FICA stands for. Um, and if a patient has paid into that um, through these, um, you know, payroll taxes, then um, and then that person later becomes disabled or um, uh, qualifies for SSDI, then um, those contributions would fund um, this disability benefit. The monthly benefit amount depends on the amount um, the person has contributed through FICA. Um, so, you know, someone who's um, a very high earner, um, who's paid quite a bit through these payroll taxes, um, will get more through SSDI than someone who may be earning a little bit less. Um, for 2023, the maximum monthly SSDI payment is 3627 um, you know, not all clients are going to get that amount. It kind of depends on their work history and how much they've earned while they're working. Um, if the earned monthly benefit to which a beneficiary is entitled to is less than what they would have gotten from the SSI payment amount, um, someone might be able to get SSI and SSDI, like the SSI would be able to make up the difference. Um, also, I just wanted to flag that the maximum monthly amount um, adjusts annually. Um, so that uh, the 2023 amount is listed on the slide, um, but next year it might be slightly higher and so forth. So it goes up a little bit each year. Um, and then we do have a lot of clients who've worked, but you know maybe they've not been the highest wage earners or just worked um, for some years. Um, so um, they might be getting SSDI between you know twelve hundred and fifteen hundred a month. So that's kind of an average amount we see in a lot of our clients. Um, but you know someone might be earning a bit more. Um, so what's important to remember is um, some people may be only entitled to and earn a monthly benefit of SSDI, which is actually less than the maximum, um, or actually less than um, the amount they would be getting for SSI. Um, so it kind of really depends, um, you know, which program, and sometimes clients will get both SSI and SSDI. Um, all right, and then um, as um, the slide points out, if the um, earned amount is less than the SSI amount, um, they might be able to get SSI as part of the difference. Um, and then eligibility for SSDI depends on how many quarters of earnings a client has over their working lifetime. Um, and after 24 months, SSDI beneficiaries automatically start receiving um, Medicare. Um, next slide. Uh, so now we'll talk about SSI, um, which is known as Supplemental um, Security Income, um, and we'll go over um, what that is. So um, SSI provides cash assistance to people who are aged, blind, um, who have a disability, and have limited income and um, limited resources. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, SSI um, doesn't require um, any work history or any quarters um, worked. 
Um, and then the amount of benefits for which a person is eligible for SSI um, differs based on a variety of factors. Um, and SSI is really seen as a safety net program. To be financially eligible for SSI, um, a person must not have monthly income from other sources of income that's more than the maximum SSI amount. Um, so, um, and also they must not have resources in excess of 2,000 if they're an individual or in excess of 3,000 um, if they're a couple. Um, and so eligibility for SSI um, can go up or down um, depending on certain factors. Um, but, you know, if a client's getting like a pension or if they're getting um, income for investments or they have, um, you know, more than $2,000 in their savings or bank account, um, then they wouldn't be eligible for SSI if their um, income or their assets is higher than their um, that amount. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, um, SSI is really designed to be like a safety net program. So um, someone has to have um, limited income. Um, so, you know, if someone's doing like a part time job as, um, you know, driving for Uber or other part time jobs and they're making, um, you know, over the income limit, then they might not be eligible for SSI. Um, and then um, there was a recent um, bill that came out um, that's trying to raise the resource limit for um, someone to still qualify for SSI. Um, but, you know, that's still something Congress is considering until that, um, you know, if that does not pass, it would still be the limited resources of no, um, no more than $2,000 as an individual. Um, there are some things that are excluded from being counted as resources. Um, so like a person could have one car that might be worth more than that amount. Um, you know, one car will be um, excluded as a countable resource. Um, a person can, is even allowed to own their own home and that one home um, is exempt from the resources limit. Um, However, there are a lot of other things that do count as resources. Um, for example, money in a bank account, um, stock, any kind of investments, all of that would count as resources um, for the so um the what I just wanted to highlight is that an individual must have um pretty limited um resources to qualify for SSI. Um, there are a couple of exceptions and in, um, in social security rules um, between what counts as resources and what doesn't. But the bottom line is it's really a safety net for people with really low resources and income. Um, unlike SSGI, SSI actually comes with automatic eligibility for Medi-Cal. Um, so the moment someone is deemed eligible for SSI, um, they'd be eligible for Medi-Cal. Um, there'd be no share of costs that they'd have to pay. Um, so um, you can compare that with SSDI. Um, with SSDI, there's a 24-month um, waiting period um, for that Medicare. Um, but with, um, with the SSI, um, they're eligible um, from the beginning uh, as soon as they get it. Um, and then what no share of costs means is that the individual doesn't have to pay like any co-pays or deductibles or premium costs um, associated with that Medi-Cal. Um, so that's really good news for many clients as um, once they're um, enrolled in SSI, that gets linked to their Medi-Cal and they're automatically enrolled in uh, Medi-Cal as soon as their SSI application is approved. Um, so next slide. Um, so this slide um, can give you a sense of how the SSI benefit rate can vary um, depending on a whole host of factors. Um, so you can see here, um, here are some of the um, examples of what someone um, in independent living um, might get. Um, independent living status means someone's like living in their um, apartment or home um, or maybe in a shared home and they're paying their fair share of the rent. Um, 
So like if they're maybe if they're living with one other post person, they're both paying half. Um, and then um, you can see that um, someone in individual living um, status, they would have, um, you know, access to um, cooking facilities or access to things like that. They're able to um, live and meet their basic needs. However, the amount does go up slightly um, depending on if a person falls in some of these other categories. Um, so if a person um, is eligible for SSI, um, based on a disability of blindness, um, they would get a slightly higher amount. Um, and then um, if you go a couple lines down in that table, um, if someone has independent living status, but no cooking facilities, um, so this might be a person who is unhoused and doesn't have access to like a working stove, a working oven, they don't have any way to prepare food or meals. They're going to be eligible for an increased rate of SSI. Um, yeah, so you can see um, if it's SSI based on age or um, SSI based on disability, they get somewhat of a higher amount to kind of um, compensate for the fact that if you don't have access to cooking facilities, um, you're going to have to spend a little bit more to buy food out or buy ready to eat meals. Um, so that's why um, that person might get a higher rate. Um, I won't go through every single cell on this table. Um, but SSI, um, the amount of benefits can go down. Um, if an individual is receiving something that's known as in-kind support and maintenance. Um, so if you imagine like a client um, who's maybe living um, with a family member and maybe the family member is paying like 90% of the rent and the costs and they might be paying a little bit, that, that amount that um, the other person's um, paying, like that rent and that support, that's called in-kind support, um, which is basically food or shelter or other um, provisions through the assistance of a third party. Um, so that's why you can see that the, um, the row where it says living in the household of someone else, they're getting um, a smaller amount of um, SSI benefits. Um, and the idea is um, SSI basically counts um, the maintenance and support from that third party as, um, as um, income considerations, and they reduce their SSI by about um, a third. Um, all right, so um, if you take for an example, um, an individual who's blind or an individual who has a, um, is a minor child with a disability, um, you can see um, their benefits um, might be different as well. Um, so the, one of the main takeaways um, from this slide is that people who are on SSI should um, make sure they're communicating with Social Security about their living situation. Um, with the cost of living in the Bay Area being so high, you know, clients might go from, um, you know, living in an apartment to being unhoused to living with someone else. They might have changes in their living situation, and that might affect their benefits amount. Um, so particularly if you notice a client um, who was ha having, you know, independent living status, and then, um, you know, became unhoused, um, they should notify um, Social Security immediately, um, because then they might get um, a little bit more in benefits. Likewise, if you have the reverse situation, um, where someone was unhoused getting a, a, um, SSI, and then they move in to living with a family member, um, they need to notify SSI, because if then they get um, in-kind support or they get access to um, cooking facilities, then they're actually getting more SSI than um, SSA rules entitles them to. Um, and this could result in an overpayment later on, um, where Social Security says um, that person owes Social Security money because um, they were getting paid more benefits than they were entitled to. So we want clients to make sure they're communicating with the Social Security Administration um, to let them know about their living arrangements. That way they can get the correct amount of SSI 
um, for their um, current um, situation. Um, so this is a good slide to refer back to um, if you're ever concerned about your client, um, you know, not getting the right amount of benefits, um, you know, they might need to reach out to Social Security, um, or if they're still um, having trouble or getting confused, um, that could also be referred to the Law Foundation. Uh, so now we can go on to the next slide. Um, so, um, as you know, we just went over some of the differences between SSI um, and SSDI. SSDI was the um, insurance-based program and SSI, the safety net program. But when we first talked about the two programs, we um, mentioned that the one important factor that unites these two programs um, is both SSDI and SSI require the same finding of disability. Um, so let's talk about what Social Security's definition of disability is. So Social Security um, defines disability as a person's inability to engage or do any substantial gainful activity. And we often refer to this as SGA um, because substantial gainful activity is really a mouthful. Um, but what that means is the person is unable to um, do any, um, any SGA, like unable to work or do any kind of meaningful um, activity or work where they're earning um, more than that limit. Um, so this um, SGA limit changes um, each year. Um, so in 2023, um, the um, SGA limit was $14.70 a month. Um, so if a person is earning more than $14.70 a month, even if they have like some kind of physical health condition or mental health condition, then they would be unable to get um, SSI or SSDI is their um, earning over the SGA limit. Um, and um, unfortunately, this is the same uh, limit throughout the country um, because Social Security is a federal program. So even though the costs of living are so high in the Bay Area and, you know, clients, um, if they're earning minimum wage or working a certain a number of hours a month, they might, you know, fall over this 1470 um, limit. And then if they do, um, they, that would be considered um, SGA um, and would prevent someone from being eligible um, for either SSI or SSDI. Um, and the idea is Social Security really wants to know if someone can engage in work and get more than this um, income limit. Um, and um, if someone's unable to um, work that amount um, and also has a medically determinable physical or mental impairment, that would qualify um, for social security disability, provided that that physical or mental impairment has lasted or expected to last for 12 months or more, or it results in death. So it's important to remember that this is not a short term medical condition. Um, so if someone, you know, has like a broken leg, but that's expected to resolve, um, you know, in two to three months, that would not be a disability um, that would last more than a year and thus wouldn't qualify under Social Security rules. Um, so, you know, social under Social Security rules, like a disability is not a short term um, medical condition unless it lasts a year or longer or is potentially um, fatal. Um, so if a client is diagnosed with cancer and given a prognosis of, you know, six months um, to live, that, you know, could result in death and that, um, you know, might qualify for a disability. Um, and then one thing I wanted to note is that um, Social Security's definition of disability um, it may be different from what a client's doctor says or, you know, what a client's um, employer says. Um, it's a pretty uh, strict definition in requiring um, that it be a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that lasts more than 12 months or resulting in death. Um, and then whether someone meets this definition of disability or not, 
is made as um, is determined by an agency known as the DDS. And the DDS is the um, State Disability um, Determination Services Agency. Um, and this is an agency with whom um, Social Security contracts um, and DDS um, decides um, if that person um, would qualify um, for disability under Social Security rules. Um, and DDS does the work of requesting medical records. Um, so they try to um, get these records to evaluate um, if a person um, is disabled under Social Security rules. They may also refer clients um, to the DDS contracted um, doctors, um, where these doctors might do a consultative exam. Um, we'll go over what that means in a little bit. But basically, they go through a whole process reviewing medical records, um, sometimes having a doctor do an exam, do all this, uh, this process to determine um, whether someone is disabled or not under um, Social Security um, guidelines. Um, and so now we can go on to the um, next slide. Um, so this slide um, goes through the five steps of um, Social Security and the disability evaluation. Um, so the first step is um, to determine if someone's working and earning more than the um, substantial gainful activity amount. If someone is engaged in substantial gainful activity, um, you know, that, that would be the end of the process. They would not qualify for SSI or SSDI. Um, and this five-step process, um, you know, the initial determination is um, done by DDS. Um, they go through the five steps um, to determine if someone um, qualifies for disability. Um, and so then um, if someone is not working um, or, you know, maybe they're working a little bit and they're earning less than SGA, um, then um, they, uh, Social Security would go on to step two. Um, and then um, another thing I wanted to flag with um, step one is um, uh, Social Security looks at the um, gross earnings, not the net, unfortunately. Um, and then the next step is um, Social Security determines if a claimant has a severe impairment, um, such as a mental health um, disability or physical um, health disability. Um, so if someone, you know, doesn't have um, a qualifying health condition, um, Social Security will stop and decide that this person is not um, going to qualify for either SSDI or SSI. Um, and then, yeah, just also going to flag that this five-step um, sequential disability evaluation process, um, these five steps are gone through um, for both SSI and SSDI. Um, and then um, with step two, um, the, the agency looks at whether um, the claimant has a severe um, impairment. So they'll go through the medical records. Um, if the impairment is not severe, um, then Social Security um, will deny um, the application. Um, but um, if Social Security says, yes, this person does have a severe impairment, um, then it will proceed to step three. Um, and then um, some people may not know, but um, these impairments can be mental or physical. Um, we've had clients with, um, you know, bipolar disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder um, who qualify for SSI or SSDI. Um, so these impairments do not have to be physical. They could be mental, physical, a combination. Um, okay, so now on to step three. Here, Social Security asks, Okay, so this client does have an impairment. Does it meet or equal one of our listings? Um, so we're going to go through the listings um, again in a little bit. Um, but just to uh, quickly explain, um, like a listing involves um, like a certain mental health or a physical health um, disability um, and different symptoms or criteria for a, a claimant's condition to qualify um, as a, a listed um, impairment. Um, so we'll go through that um, a, a little bit. 
Um, there are some um, conditions that might, you know, automatically qualify um, for a listing. Like um, maybe someone has like um, a cancer diagnosis and they meet the um, certain criteria for that listing. Um, so they might meet step three. Um, there are other times when a claimant's health condition, there might be more ambiguity on if they meet a listing or not. Um, but we'll go through that um, in a little bit. Um, and then if a claimant um, does have an impairment that um, meets or equals a listing, um, that, and then yes, um, a, a person would qualify for SSI or SSDI. They essentially win, they get benefits. But if no, if they don't qualify under step three, um, then we would proceed um, through two more steps. The process would not end um, if someone doesn't qualify for a listing. Um, so step four um, involves seeing if the person can return to his or her um, or their past relevant work. Um, so Social Security um, will look at what jobs the individual has done be uh, before and see if that client can do that type of work. If they can, then they're going to be determined um, not disabled. If no, if a client cannot engage in their past relevant work, then Social Security has to ask one more question before approving or denying the application. Step five, can the individual do any type of work that exists in significant numbers in the national economy? Um, so this is like a tricky question. So unfortunately, it's not whether a client can do their dream job or a job they've always wanted. Like maybe someone has a disability that prevents them from you know, becoming a doctor or doing their dream job, but they're still able to do other types of jobs, um, then you know, they might be able to do jobs that still exist in significant numbers in the economy. Um, so you know, Social Security often denies people at step five. Um, like if someone um, you know, is not able to um, do certain types of jobs like physical or manual labor, but maybe they can do a sedentary job like answering phones or addressing envelopes, things like that, then a client might be denied at step five. Um, if Social Security determines that there are not any jobs that exist um, in significant numbers in the economy, um, then a client can be approved at step five and be entitled to SSDI or SSI based on the other eligibility um, criteria. So this, these five steps, it's a pretty um, in-depth, onerous process. So it's not just um, a simple question, um, does a doctor think a client's disabled or not? Unfortunately, it's a very rigorous five-step process when evaluating um, these applications for benefits. Um, next slide. Um, so let's talk more about um, listings. Because if a client can meet a listing, um, it's to the client's advantage. They're gonna win at step three, and then they don't have to um, worry about step four and step five. Um, so it's really you know nice for the client to just have to go to step one, step two, step three, and then get benefits. Um, and then they don't have to worry about you know the um, issue of work in the national economy or past relevant work. Um, so yeah, if a client can meet um, a listing, that is ideal. Um, so social security listings provide examples of conditions that are presumed to be disabling. Um, and there are many different listings for all kinds of different um, health conditions and physical and health um, disabilities. Um, and um, Social Security has um, on their site or um, in their rules um, lists of conditions and what um, qualifies for someone to meet a listing. Um, and these conditions are presumed to be automatically um, disabling. Um, so um, DDS will again um, 
For those who've forgotten, DDS is the state agency that makes the disability determination. So they will look at a person's medical records, look at their diagnoses, um, the symptoms they've suffered, um, what kinds of no uh, notes the doctors wrote, clinical findings related to the person's diagnosis and treatment, um, any functional limitations. For example, maybe a person has a health condition that's preventing them from, you know, walking or preventing them from uh, making meals or talking on the phone. All of those are examples of things a person can't or cannot do um, as a result of the disability. So what DDS will do is they'll compare the diagnosis um, and the symptoms, um, and they'll make findings. Um, they'll review the functional limitations. Um, they'll look at the criteria that Social Security has established through their specific listings, um, examine all the medical records from a client's treatment they've received. Um, and then they'll determine if a client's condition meets or equals the listings that Social Security has outlined. If a patient does meet a listing, then they'll be found disabled. Um, so we won't go through um, all the examples in detail, but um, Social Security has a whole list of web, uh, of listings on their website. Um, they're organized around different um, body uh, systems. Um, so like mental health conditions are kind of in one set of listings. Um, you might see um, like cancer in another set of listings. Um, but so like um, Social Security has listings for conditions like schizophrenia, depression, or anxiety. Um, so if a client has medical re uh, records that show their diagnosis, show their symptoms, um, and meet the um, clinical criteria um, and qualify for the listing, then they might um, win on that step three process. Um, you might also see listings related to neurological disorders. Um, so for example, epilepsy and traumatic brain injury are two specific diagnoses that have listings. There's also a section on listings related to uh, musculoskeletal um, system disorders, like disorders of the spine or um, the skeletal system. Um, clients who have a, had an amputation, they might qualify under one of those listings. Um, in addition, their listings related to very specific um, respiratory disorders. Um, so a client who has asthma, there's a listing for asthma. Um, there's a listing for cystic fibrosis. There are also listings for cardiovascular disorders. Um, so maybe you have a client who's living with chronic heart failure. Um, they might qualify on a, under a listing related to that. Um, so that's not the entire you know, universe of all the listings that Social Security has, um, but just a sample. So you can get a sense here of some of the different diagnoses or conditions that Social Security has specified and laid out. Um, so um, that, this is part of why it's really key um, for clients like medical records and ha have, you know, treatment records to show that they um, meet the listings, if that might be um, applicable for them. Um, so ne now next slide. Um, so now um, we'll talk about what happens if your client doesn't win at step three. Um, so then we have to go on to step four and step five um, if someone loses at step three or can't prove that they need a listing at step three. Um, then Social Security will go on um, through steps four and five. Um, to see if um, a person might have um, might qualify for SSI or SSDI benefits. Um, and then Social Security um, has the burden of evaluating whether an individual has the ability to work. Um, so um, what they'll look at is something called um, a client's residual functional capacity. Um, and this involves taking into consideration all of the client's physical limitations or mental limitations. How much is that person still able to do? Um, so Social Security will break it down. 
they'll break it down into limitations um, involving physical. So um, this is known as like exertional limitations. Um, and social security will evaluate whether a person's disability impacts how much they can physically do. Um, for example, um, it might impact their ability to stand, to walk, to sit, um, hold, or twist. Um, so if a client, you know, has a spinal condition, they might not be able to bend or do other um, physical um, tasks like that. Um, they'll also have um, exertional limitations such as sedentary, light, medium, or heavy. Um, that just means that's based on how much a person can lift um, or carry. Um, and um, it's really a question of whether a person's disability, physical disability impacts their ability to do any of those kinds of tasks or physical movements. Um, and if so, if that disability does um, prevent them from doing things, Social Security might classify that person as sedentary, meaning they can't really um, do any of these um, more active um, or heavy lifting tasks. It's really, they're uh, limited to sitting or maybe lifting just a light, very light to a few pounds um, or, you know, moving, you know, small movements. Um, so, and, there, and there might be, you know, medium um, exertional limitations where someone can lift a heavier amount of weight or maybe they can stand for several hours or walk a, a significant distance. So um, these exertional limitations are kind of range depending on a person's um, physical condition. Like um, someone who's on heavy um, exertional limitations, they might be able to lift, you know, 50 pounds or more or be able to stand and walk for six out of eight hours a day. Um, so it kind of depends. Social security evaluates exertional limitations based on the medical records. Um, so based on, you know, what doctors have said about how much a person can lift or carry, how long they can walk or stand, and how much frequency during the day um, someone can do these tasks. Like maybe they can walk for only, you know, one hour of a day because of their physical health conditions. Um, so Social Security um, will look at the exertional limitations to see if that impacts whether or not there are jobs that exist for that person to engage in. Um, in addition to exertional limitations, Social Security will also evaluate whether a person has non-exertional limitations. So non-exertional limitations might also be considered like mental health limitations. So this isn't about, you know, standing or walking, but really whether an individual can maintain um, concentration or you know, persist on a task, um, interact with others. Um, so I can go through um, a few examples of what that might mean. Um, so maybe a person has, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, and because of their frequent, um, you know, panic, panic attacks, they're unable to, um, you know, concentrate on a task for, um, for a significant amount of time. They can't do that. Um, or maybe, you um, someone has, um, you know, anxiety disorder, and they're unable to, you know, interact with um, other people, um, you know, they get um, anxious or fearful about interacting with supervisors or the public, that might be a non-exertional limitation. Um, sometimes we see, um, you know, in our clients that um, someone needs, you know, a lots of um, breaks that they can't focus on a task um, for six or seven hours that might, you know, because they can't concentrate or focus on a task that might prevent them from working. Um, other examples of non-exertional limitations, maybe someone can't follow step-by-step -step instructions. Maybe they need like constant reminders um, or they need to, um, you know, they can't um, interact with a supervisor or accept feedback. All of those um, are skills that are necessary to do many jobs, but you know might not be possible for some clients um, with uh, certain disabilities. Um, and then you might also think about you know pace. So maybe you know um, someone without a health condition might be able to you know make ten things in an hour or process like ten widgets. 
um, but you know, someone with a certain health condition or mental health condition, and might take them, you know, all day to do make one thing in a factory, and that would not be possible for certain jobs, um, if they're not able to keep the pace of the work. Um, and so um, Social Security will evaluate whether a person as a result of their mental health limitations or their mental health um, disabilities is able to um, do some of these tasks involving you know, concentration or interaction. Um, Another um, thing that comes up a lot with disabilities is whether someone can interact appropriately um, with the general public. Um, if someone is screaming or enrages or having, you know, hallucinations and they're not able to um, interact with people because they feel threatened or unsafe, that might prevent someone from doing um, certain jobs because of their non-exertional limitations. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with step four and step five, it's looking at whether um, a client can do um, jobs that exist in the national economy. Um, and so it's not their dream job, um, but really jobs that exist out um, and are available. Um, and Social Security has um, something called like a dictionary of occupational titles, where they look at, you know, all these different jobs that are available um, and what um, criteria might be made. So that's kind of how they decide whether someone can do those jobs. Um, all right. And um, yeah, just um, a constant reminder that, um, yeah, if you have any questions to do them in the chat. And yeah, as Rachel said, exertional limitations are physical, non-exertional limitations are mental. Um, and yeah, if more questions come up, please bring them on in the chat and um, Rachel will continue to answer them. Um, and yeah. Um, what Social Security is interested in is, you know, whether a person can do a job given their mental and physical um, limitations that would earn them over the substantial gainful activity amount. So over that 1400 um, threshold. If they cannot, if a client cannot, then they would get approved um, for a disability. Um, after step five, after step four, if they can't do their past relevant work, and then, or they would get approved at step five, um, and step five, if they find that they can't do any work um, in the economy. Um, and then um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, a lot of times questions come up related to um, the use of drug, drugs and um, alcohol um, or other substance use um, and how this might impact uh, a client's application for social security benefits. Um, so I wanted to say up front that clients do not have to be um, you know, sober um, and clean to qualify for social security benefits, but it is a consideration what Social Security is really looking at is whether an individual's impairments um, still exist when the person is not using. Um, so, you know, even if a client <coughs> is, um, you know, in these periods of sobriety or um, times when they're not um, using substances, that, that person still has um, a physical health disability or a mental health disability um, that's preventing them from working. Um, so um, a, a client really has to show that their impairments still meet disability criteria, even with um, total sobriety. Um, so we have some um, tips and suggestions. Um, so one is um, to consider um, you know, times um, like showing that the problems occur during periods of sobriety, um, documenting functional impairments that um, come before substance use or impairments that still exist when a client is sober. Um, looking for other impairments such as traumatic brain injury, neurocognitive disorders, trauma and um, personality disorders. All of those, um, you know, might condition be conditions um, helping a person qualify under Social Security um, rules. 
Um, so sometimes a person might have, you know, in the medical records where it says, oh, a client came in, they tested positive for methamphetamine use, and they're having severe hallucinations. Um, okay, but are there also times in the medical record that show, oh, you know, clients living in a sober living um, center, um, they tested negative for drug use, they're still having severe um, hallucinations, even when they're not under the influence? Um, do these problems still continue? Um, so um, at our organization as advocates and attorneys, when we're helping clients with the appeal process, we look through the medical records, we talk to our clients about whether they can document that they've had these health impairments before or during this, um, before or after the substance use, um, or anything like that, that can help um, support their application for benefits. Um, and then some of these organic impairments, like traumatic brain injury, you know, you can say that that's, you know, not related or not um, related to the drug use. It's something that's going to exist independently due to substance use. Um, similarly, like a personality disorder, that's going to be um, present um, regardless of someone's on uh, drugs or alcohol or not. Um, so those are some ways in which um, a person should still, um, you know, consider trying to apply for benefits or, um, you know, going through the appeal process um, despite having substance use. Um, substance use doesn't mean um, that an application is denied necessarily. It just may mean there's some hardships to overcome, but um, a client's eligibility is still worth evaluating, still worth um, applying for benefits. Um, so this slide just kind of gave some tips on how to handle that if you see clients coming in. Um, next slide. Um, so another issue that comes up a lot is um, immigrant eligibility for benefits. Um, so many times people are concerned because the clients they're working with um, are immigrants or non-citizens, um, and they're wondering if they might be eligible for SSI um, or SSDI. So um, there are some very specific rules about em immigrant eligibility for both types of benefits. Um, and so um, when I refer to immigrants, um, that might be someone who's not a citizen. It might be someone who's lawful, a lawful permanent resident, someone who hasn't received citizenship status yet. Um, so immigrants are still eligible for um, Social Security disability insurance if they have worked and paid into the Social Security system prior to the onset of their disability. Um, and when I say like paid into the social security system, I mean like, you know, they've worked and some of their wages have been deducted on their paychecks or on their W-2s and they're um, contributing um, via those payroll taxes um, to this um, social security disability insurance program. And this kind of goes back to the idea that SSDI is an insurance-based program. Um, so a person's immigration status is not really relevant to the question of if they paid into the social security system through sufficient work prior to the onset of the disability, and then they become disabled. Um, so some of these number of work credits or work history accrued. Um, they paid into the insurance system through their FICA taxes. Um, then yes, they're going to be eligible to apply for um, and potentially receive um, SSDI if they meet the um, steps under the five-step uh, process. Um, so um, really, it's a question of um, if they've been um, paying into the system and having a sufficient work uh, history and work credits. Um, and then um, for an immigrant to qualify for SSDI, they have to be lawfully present in the United States. So that means the client has to have a valid social security number. Um, and then um, there are a few other criteria um, available. Um, so the unfortunate news is that um, if you are undocumented or have a client who's undocumented, um, they wouldn't be eligible for SSDI 
even if they have sufficient work credit. So it's really important um, that they have had a, like a valid social security number or, you know, Homeland Security is aware of their um, presence and other things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I know that can be disappointing to many clients, but that's um, one of the threshold um, criteria for eligibility. Um, so next slide. Um, so SSI, um, so SSI, um, you know, we talked earlier, it's different from SSDI because it doesn't require a work history or any kind of um, payroll taxes or anything like that. Um, so SSI is typically not available for non-citizens. However, there's certain categories of immigrants that are eligible for SSI. Um, so the individual has to be um, lawfully um, residing in the United States um, on um, August 22nd, 1996, and the individual being blind or disabled um, or qualifying for a disability. Um, the individual has to have been, um, um, and so um, then there are like a few um, examples, like so an individual was receiving SSI on that um, date in um, 1966, and then the individual was lawfully residing in the United States there after that time. Um, or the individual was lawfully admitted to permanent residence under um, Immigration and Nationality Act, and they've had um, some amount of work history. Um, so the reason these categories are very specific is just it has to do with um, social security laws um, and legislation that's been passed by Congress, um, allowing these certain categories to qualify. Um, and then there are some other limited exceptions, like um, someone who qualifies for asylum status and other things like that. Um, we're not going to go through that in detail. Um, you know, at Law Foundation, we don't practice immigration law. So there are times, like if you think a, a client might qualify under like asylum status or they have questions about their immigration status, um, they might want to consider co contacting an immigration lawyer. Um, also, um, uh, those three groups, um, you know, that's, um, those might be eligible for SSI. Um, and um, there, there are other types of benefits programs um, where immigrants might qualify for. Um, we'll talk about the cash assistance program for immigrants um, in a moment. Um, and that might be something that um, an immigrant might qualify for. Um, and so, yeah, before applying for SSI, um, SSI linked Medi-Cal or any government bro program, um, clients might want to talk to an immigration um, attorney just to discuss any questions they have about their immigration status. Um, and then um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so individuals who don't qualify for SSI based on their immigration status, um, but who are disabled or blind or and low income should consider applying for um, the Cash Assistant Program for Immigrants or CAPI. Um, and this is um, a program that's um, in California um, and um, someone could apply um, through the county um, social services agency. Um, someone can apply for CAPI online on the social services website. Um, they could apply by phone by calling that number or they could go in person um, to the county social services office on 1919 um, Center Road. Um, and CAPI is not administered by Social Security. It's a non-Social Security program. Um, but it was designed, you know, with the understanding that there are many um, immigrants or non-citizens who are not eligible for SSI. But, you know, California wanted to have like a resource or social safety net um, for those programs. Um, so um, for people to qualify, they would still have to um, be too disabled to work, um, have low income, limited assets. Um, and then another threshold criteria is that they um, would not qualify for SSI because of their immigration. Um, so to be eligible for CAPI, um, one of the requirements is that someone apply for SSI 
and then be denied because of their immigration status. Um, and so sometimes um, our organization advises people on the CAPI process, um, but you know, typically someone would want to um, apply for SSI first, be denied, and then go through the CAPI process. Um, and um, if um, I'm just going to take a quick look. Um, oh, does your agency help with CAPI appeals? Um, I think we do on occasion. So um, if there are any um, benefits denials, not only CAPI, but GA, CalFresh, Medi-Cal, um, you can always refer to the Law Foundation as, you know, on occasion we take those cases, as um, Rachel said. Um, and um, so uh, there's uh, the links, the online and the call-in number if someone's um, trying to get some of those local benefits. Um, and that's just the Santa Clara County information. Um, if someone lives in a different county, um, they would want to go to their own county's um, social service agency and apply there. Um, all right, so now... Um, I think we have a poll here. Um, I'm not sure if um, we'll be able to release the poll. Um, just a moment. Ah, yeah, so the poll popped up. Thank you, um, whoever did that. Um, so this question is, um, the Social Security Administration administers two types of disability programs and both require the same finding of disability, um, true or false? I'll give it a few minute, moments for everyone to answer. Yeah, looks like about 40% of people have participated, so we could maybe give it another 30 seconds and then end the poll, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, it looks like a large um, number of people have answered. Um, so I'll go ahead and say that the answer um, is true. The Social Security Administration does administer um, two types of disability programs, the SSI program and the SSDI program. Um, and um, they both require the same finding of disability, um, the true, um, the five-step disability process um, that we went over um, earlier. Um, it looks like a number of you are, uh, said false. Um, and um, if anyone has like questions about this um, or wants to um, explain any thoughts, feel free to um, put it in the chat. Um, but, you know, there are differences between the program, you know, SSI is the um, safety net program that has an income and resources limit, um, SSDI operates as an um, insurance program. So yeah, the programs are a little bit different, but they both um, require the same finding of disability. Um, so that answer is true. Um, all right, and so we can stop sharing. Does anyone have questions about that so far? Okay. Yeah, and we'll have a few um, poll questions sprinkled throughout the slide, uh, throughout the presentation, um, just so everyone can get a chance to um, practice and learn some of the principles um, we went through. Um, all right, um, so then um, our next poll question is, um, what are the two, what are two of the disability programs administered by the Social Security Administration? Um, the questions are, options are SSI and SSR, SSI and SSR. Um, oh, it looks like two of the questions, two of the responses are the same, and SSDI and SSI. <coughs> so I'll give everyone um, about like a little bit of time to answer. 
And I, I'll just clarify, I think the poll question on the presentation says the first option is SSDI and SSR. The second option is SSI and SSR. And the third option is SSDI and SSI. So I think when it got put into the poll, um, a D got forgotten on the first option, so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it looks like um, most people have answered. Um, so yes, um, that the response everyone selected was correct. Um, the two types of programs are called SSDI um, and SSI. Um, and we went over that um, a little bit earlier. So yeah, great job everyone in um, answering those two poll questions. Um, and um, if anyone has any questions about that, um, feel free to um, continue to post in the chat. Um, but now, um, next slide, we have some time for more questions. Um, so you can feel free to unmute and say your question out loud, um, or you can type your question in the chat and um, Rachel will be answering questions. Thanks everyone. Sure. Can you Sean? share what the CAPI max benefit is for people that don't have legal residence? So that's a great question. Um, if somebody is applying for CAPI, the benefit is is it like step lockstep in line with the SSI rate. So um, I think um, I'm not going to run the number off the top of my head, but I think it's like 1,133.73. Asha, I know shared the SSI slide earlier with the maximum SSI rate, but CAPI is lockstep in line with that SSI rate. So if somebody is a non-citizen and is therefore not eligible for SSI, but is still too disabled to work and therefore or applies for CAPI, the cash aid program for immigrants, and is eligible, they're going to receive essentially the same amount of money that they would receive if they were receiving SSI benefits. I think it was $14.92 and change for the SSI one. Um, the break can be different depending on what category you fall into. So it, yeah, it might've been, it was like, a, it's like, a, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but there's one rate if you're housed and have um, cooking facilities, and then there's a higher rate, slightly higher if you're unhoused and need like the meal, Subsid, uh, subsidized rate, um, but the CAPI is basically what would match or very closely match whatever a person would be receiving if they were eligible for SSI. And it's essentially California's answer to the fact that non-citizens can't get SSI. Our state has said, okay, but we want to protect non-citizens who are disabled and can't work. So if the Social Security federal government is not going to provide this benefit for them, our state and our local counties are going to administer this program that does provide that benefit for them. And so that's why the rate is lockstep with SSI rates. And that rate might vary a little bit depending on living situation um, or other circumstances, as, as Asha mentioned, is, is true for SSI so as well. So um, I had another question that you answered on the in the chat, but um, to hear it out loud, sure. I have a client that said previous to his SSDI uh, claim, he was making around $40 an hour and someone advised him not to get a job at a lower hourly wage while his SSDI claim is being settled because he was told that if he was to get like a $20 an hour job right now before it gets uh, finalized, his benefits, his monthly benefits will go down. So that's been a like a, a reason for him not to get employment. So that look on your face, perfect. So, right? Yeah, I mean, essentially, and I, Social Security is the one who does all the uh, work on the back end to determine exactly what the person's FICA contributions were. Um, but they can continue to work because they're still going to get credit for the times they were earning forty dollars an hour, um, and because that's going to that put them in a position to have contributed FICA contributions based on a forty dollar per hour. Um, wage earning. And so even if then, they then go on to just make $20 an hour and contribute a little less, they're still going to get credit and an SSDI benefit that's commensurate with whatever FICA they've paid in, both on the $40 per hour earnings and the $20 per hour earnings. So it's not like all of a sudden they go, oh, now you're making less, so we're going to drop your SSDI benefit down once you are eligible. The person is going to get credit for everything they've contributed to the insurance program regardless of whether they're at one point making 40 and then now I'm making 20. And we often tell clients like, look, we, we understand like you can't live on nothing while you wait for your SSDI application to go through. It's okay to work. 
as long as you're not working and making over SGA, because obviously if that were the case, you would lose at step one. But a lot of our clients have to work a little bit um, and doing so does not all of a sudden in like drop their potential SSDI rate down as a result of making less money. So I wouldn't, you know, I think it's if each client, if they can work at all and what they can work, but I wouldn't make a decision not to work based on a concern that all of a sudden your SSDI rate is going to drop because now you're earning less because they have paid in the FICA taxes, even on their higher earnings, and they will get credit for that. Thank um, you. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. I will answer some of the questions that came up in the chat too. Um, so does your agency help individuals who are incarcerated and are seeking to get SSI and SSDI? Yeah, we do. Um, whether we take the case on for just some counsel advice or full representation, would, we would determine on a case-by-case -case basis. But a lot of times we work with clients who were either on SSI or SSDI and then became incarcerated, and now they've been released and they don't know how to get their benefits restarted. We can help with that. Um, maybe they weren't on benefits at all before and they were incarcerated and are released. We can get them information on how to apply um, for either or both programs. Usually Social Security vets or should be vetting everybody who applies for both programs. And then we tell that individual, if you get denied, come back to us and we can help you with an appeal. Um, so, yes, we certainly help um, incarcerated individuals if we're trying to get back on or get on to benefits for the first time. Um, Alondra asked a question about they need an official letter stating they were not eligible for SSI because of non-citizenship citizenship status. I presume this relates to CAPI. And yes, that's a great question. They do. So in order to apply for CAPI, the individual must have first applied for SSI and received a letter from Social Security saying, I'm sorry, you're not eligible due to your non-citizenship status. And that letter must have been issued within the past six months. So if your client has a letter that's like a year old or a year and a half old, they're going to have to reapply for SSI and get a more recent letter because to apply for CAPI, that letter must have been issued within the last previous six months prior to the CAPI application. Um, Mario asked if someone was denied, I presumably your SSI or SSDI, then appeal them was granted, will they be retro to when they originally applied? And the answer is yes. Um, there are, um, so for example, if somebody applies for SSI and it takes them a year to get approved because of the appeal process, or maybe even two years that they have to go to hearing, they're going to get benefits back to the date they originally applied. For SSI, if you apply in, let's just say, January, and then you're determined eligible, your benefits start one month later, so your benefits will be starting in February. So if you applied in January of 2023, but you didn't get approved until January of 2024, your benefits would be retroactive to one month after you first applied, which would be February of 2023. For Social Security, it's a little different. Let's say you apply in January. Um, you can get benefits retroactively to the time, like when your uh, date of onset of disability, if it's in within like a two-year period prior to your application. I'm sorry, I don't remember all the rules, but um, off the top of my head. But if you apply and it takes you a year, a year and a half, two years to get SSDI benefits, then you will get retroactive pay. But there's typically what's known as a five-month waiting period. So your benefits would kick in five months after your date of um, onset of disability. But the, sh the simple answer to that is yes, it is retroactive payment once you're applied. And the exact date to which it's retroactive differs a little between the two programs, but there is retroactive pay. They don't have to just wait two or three years and then get approved and start benefits then. It will be retroactive based on the rules of the program for which they're applying. Um, so yeah, Alondra, I see you qualified for CAPI. So yes, that's correct. You do need that letter for CAPI. Um, does your organization help people who have lost their DMV ID and social security card and permanent resident green card only advise where to start? I think those are three different categories. So if somebody's lost their DMV ID, we do have, especially if somebody's unhoused um, or very low income, we are authorized to provide what's known as like a reduced or no fee um, DMV or ID card replacement form. And we can give that to the person, help them fill it out if we've got time and then give them instructions on how to go to DMV to replace either their ID or their license. But we don't actually go through the actual process with them. We just hand out a form and help explain to them how they fill it out so they can get reduced or free replacement. Um, yeah, for social... that, I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. That sure. was my question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, we tried to, yes, he is unhoused and we try to get them the DMV ID, but DMV is asking for legal presence. So they want to know, okay. You know how so it's like a circular problem and we don't know how to help because they need the green card or some proof of passport or something like that and everything was mm -hmm. stolen so just a if you want maybe to, yeah maybe the client can call us because we do have a form okay. 
that we have been provided by the DMV that authorizes us to let them get a reduced fee or a yeah. fee card. I have um, that. Yeah, we have that form. We took that <laughs> uh, and filled out everything else. But in order to reinstate the ID, which is a valid ID, they can see in their system. Yeah. Yeah. They can't give it unless there's uh, the legal presence is um, is proven. Um, well, so, the legal presence in the United States is proven? In the United States, yes. Oh, sorry. but they've lost their social security information. Yes. Green card. Okay. So in that case, uh, we do help with ob obtaining new social security cards. There's a very simple form that we can show a client how to fill out or help them fill out so they can go to social security and get a replacement social security card, which would oh, provide... They don't need an ID for that because I thought they need an ID to. Uh, yes, they're missing their ID. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it does become very circular. I'm not quite yeah. sure. I'd have to do okay. a how to present it to the DMV if you're missing all of that evidence. I don't know off the top of my head. I do know that for the permanent resident green card, we don't typically help. We would point them in the person in the direction of like an immigration attorney or give them okay. just some um, forms from the USCIS website on real. Yeah, okay. Freedom of information. Card. Yeah. Yeah. Not a freedom of information, but there's a pretty simple form to get oh. your permanent resident card, um, your permanent residence, your certificate of like permanent residence reinstate, not reinstated or reissued. So you have another copy. But again, it's like, I don't know, they might need your ID for that. or your social Yes, card. I so think I they need the number. I think they need the number, the A number. Or yeah. it, it just sounds like a client you might want to refer through to our intake line just so we can come okay. a little okay. bit more. Um, Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I have a question. Sure. Okay, so um, I have a two-part question. I'm a case manager over at a shelter, yeah. and um, one of my clients, um, she has um, uh, Asperger um syndrome or something mm -hmm. like that, and she gets both. She gets um SSID and then she gets SSI. Yes, she worked when she was a young age, right? Yeah. Okay. So now, um, they didn't tell her. No, Social Security was not aware that she was homeless. Oh originally she was staying with her grandparents and they sold the home and they left out of state. So now she's staying at the shelter. Her income is very low and I wanted to find a way that we can increase her income for her to at least be able to rent an apartment. She's not able to work. Um, she's been going through services um, with her therapist and psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, she does a lot. Um, she does some other kind of services with other agencies, but when I asked the question to, I, I want to just get, get a better understanding. Her SSID might not increase, but with her, will her SSI increase because now um, she's homeless? Yes. So the SSDI, will, you're right, correct, will not increase at all or will not change at all based on her living situation. Her SSDI rate is established by, you know, how much she earned when she did earn in the past and what her FICA contributions were. Her SSI, right? So um, if she's getting SSDI and let's say she's getting 600 or 700, hypothetically, that is less than the maximum SSI rate. Um, and so she should be making up or Social Security should be paying her the difference between her SSDI rate at 700 and her maximum SSI rate eligibility. Her SSI rate uh, when she was living with her grandparents was probably less than it is now if she's unhoused and has no cooking facilities. So let's say, you know, the maximum rate for um, a housed individual um, is like 1,133.73, I think off the top of my head. So she would have been getting a couple hundred in SSDI and then a little bit more in SSI to make sure she got that full 1,133.73. But now that she's unhoused and probably does not have access to cooking facilities, unless, unless the shelter she's staying at gives her like three meals a day, she should notify social security that she's not housed and that she qualifies for the unhoused SSI rate, which would bring her SSI rate up a little bit more. The I thing is, that. yeah, but the thing is there's a maximum SSI rate. So even whether you're getting the like the rate of that 1,133.73 or the 1,400, I can't remember the exact number. Um, it, 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 it depends on whether she has access to cooking facilities or not. So if she does not, social security should know She's in a shelter. They'll have you fill out a form. That's the um, kind of meal. It's called the meal and restaurant allowance form, but it's essentially the form that says she's unhoused, can't cook, needs to buy food out, and therefore should be getting a little bit more in SSI. The problem is if she becomes housed again, like which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing if she's able to get to an apartment and afford an apartment. But if she's in an apartment and it has cooking facilities there, 
um, and the rate would drop again to that 1,133 cents. Um, and I think the biggest problem is, as you mentioned, it's it's difficult to be able to rent an apartment, whether regardless of what SSI rate you're on, because yeah. it, you know 1,133.73 a month does not cover rent and other necessities. Um, at but the I would, moment, sorry, I, at the moment yeah. she gets less than that. She barely gets with both like under eight hundred dollars. Okay. So to me, that says that there's maybe some things that Social Security is not aware of. Because, yes. Uh, or or there's a, it would, you probably, you and your client would benefit from calling them to find out why her rate is so low. Is there an overpayment they're collecting on? Is there a way to address that overpayment? Are they not aware that her living situation has changed? Um, and, and so I think this is one of those cases where I try to troubleshoot with the client and call Social Security. But if you're getting pushback or having trouble, because as yes. Asha mentioned, it can be difficult. Yes. Um, this is definitely a client you could call our intake line about and talk to us so we could see what we can do to help as well. Okay. Um, because and then, they have, as well. and then I have one more client. Um, okay. I have another client who is about 73 years old. She's worked and now she gets her um, SSI because she's retired. But her SSI is like 377 a month. So... If she's getting 370, if she's worked and she's now retired, that sounds like retirement benefits, not SSI benefits. Okay. If she's getting 373 a month in retirement, um, that to me says that she is low income and probably has very few assets and she meets the age criteria for SSI. So she should apply for SSI. You know, maybe she, you can't, you don't just get it. Social Security doesn't just go, here you go, here's your um, SSI. But she should say, I'm 73. I'm low income. I only receive 373 in a month. I'm probably eligible for SSI benefits. And so she should start that application um, because she's going to qualify automatically based on her age for SSI. And if her only income is really the 373 that she gets for retirement, because she probably worked but maybe didn't earn a lot. So her retirement benefits are pretty low. She's going to qualify for the additional money in SSI. And that would bring her up to like, you know, hopefully if she gets SSI, that 1,133.73 rate. Because just as Anuja mentioned, um, sorry, just as Asha mentioned, I'm sorry, Asha. Um, just as Asha mentioned, you can get a combination of SSDI and SSI. You can also get a combination of Social Security retirement and SSI if your Social Security retirement is so low that, that you're low income and low resource. So I would highly recommend that that client apply for SSI benefits. Um, and I think Asha is going to talk in just a few minutes about the application process. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just answer a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Laundra asked, and I think this relates back to the first question. Yes, it is necessary to apply for SSI to then apply for the CAFI program. Um, does our agency help with who clients are experiencing fraud in their social security? We don't typically take cases like that. We can give some brief advice and some information about how to report the fraud to social security, and then social security should step in and assist. Um, what should a client do if their payment has been paused because it was reported they were incarcerated when he was not? That client needs to get in touch with Social Security as soon as possible and try to rectify the error. Um, I'm not sure who reported they were incarcerated, but um, usually Social Security has a can talk to or get information from county jail or the prison. Um, and so there should be some report. Or um, I, I think it's funny because if you're trying to prove a negative, it's like the jail is not going to issue a report saying they weren't incarcerated. But I think that the client should definitely get in touch with Social Security, find out why Social Security thinks that, and ask what they need to rectify or to kind of correct that error. Um, CAPI, like SSI and SSDI, cannot be granted to persons who are undocumented. So um, yeah, unfortunately, I think CAPI is if you're a non-citizen, but I think you, you still need to be here under lawful permanent, you, need, you, you know, Department of Homeland Security needs to know you're here. You need to have been, be lawfully present in the country, even if you're not a citizen. Um, if a child with a mental health behavioral diagnosis was denied due to household income being too high, should parents still appeal the process that was the likelihood of being granted benefits? I presume this is a child applying for SSI. Um, if they are denied because the household income is too high, I think whether or not they appeal the process is, appeal that is dependent upon whether they think that assessment of the income is accurate. Because if income is too high, then that's a, you know, a direct disqualification for benefits. If you're over income, or over assets and resourced, you're not gonna get SSI. And so um, it may not be worth it to appeal unless the, the person thinks that there was something somehow miscalculated or inaccurate. 
from Social Security to determine the person's income. And so if they are over income and the likelihood of being granted benefits is zero, zero, they're not going to get benefits if they're over income. Okay. I'll pause here and I'll continue to monitor the chat if other questions come up. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so now we'll continue to talk about how to apply for SSI and SSDI. Um, next slide. Um, and um, so, and yeah, we can go on to the next slide. So we'll go over how to apply first and then the appeal process. So the SSI or SSDI application process begins when a person first um, submits a claim, um, when they first apply. Um, so come, some clients, you know, um, call the office and um, they do the application by phone. Um, some people, um, you know, file the claim online through the Social Security website. Um, and then there are some clients who um, do the paper application in the Social Security office. Um, so um, if individuals want to apply for benefits, um, they can call um, or file a claim online. And the day they apply um, starts as their protective filing date, um, which you know matters um, in the Social Security application process. <laughs> um, because um, that's you know when the application first begins. Um, and um, that kind of impacts when they get paid out benefits. Um, and um, if you call the um, number, a client will end up getting uh, like a phone appointment or interview um, with a local um, security office. Um, during that interview, um, Social Security will ask like basic questions about a client's um, de details, contact information, um, some of their work history, uh, mental health and medical health conditions, um, and things like that. Um, it might take some time to get a phone appointment or a phone interview, um, like it might take a week, a little longer. Um, so that's just kind of um, so, some more about the process. To complete the application, there are different application forms. Um, our organization typically doesn't complete forms for these clients just because it's not within our bandwidth to do. And also because it's Social Security's um, job to help um, clients, particularly clients with disabilities, um, do those applications. Um, and then Social Security will ask um, people to fill out disability reports um, to talk about um, what med medical conditions they have, um, you know, what hospitals or doctors clients are going to, what medications they're on, um, what are the client's symptoms or side effects from those medications. Um, and the, this disability report really outlines for Social Security um, what a person's disability um, looks like. And so Social Security um, can make a determination. Um, and then so the next part of the process is Social Security determines, um, makes a non-medical determination. Um, that determination for SSDI might be, does this person have enough uh, work credits to be S eligible for SSDI? Um, in terms of SSI, it looks at, does a person have um, limited income and limited assets um, to meet the eligibility for SSI? Um, and SSA does that first because, you know, if, as, if someone doesn't meet that um, non-medical eligibility criteria, then Social Security won't go through the o onerous process of doing a disability evaluation if someone already doesn't qualify from the beginning. Um, also, um, Social Security will send all the medical information and records to the DDS agency. Um, a disability analyst will be assigned to do an evaluation of the person's medical records. Um, Social Security may um, send um, a client to consultative exams. Um, so that means like a contracted doctor um, through the DDA agency will do an evaluation of a patient's uh, medical or mental health um, um, condition <laughs> to get more information about the person's um, health condition and impairments. Um, then DDS will process the claim, decide if a person um, is disabled or not, um, and then they'll um, return the claimant's folder 
um, can, including all the materials and the records. They'll send that back to the local social security office. Um, in the Bay Area, there are like a number of different offices um, depending on where a client lives. So a client's local office might be in downtown San Jose, or if they applied in Mountain View, it might be going to the Mountain View social security office. Um, the local so so uh, social security office will send a letter to the claimant um, saying if the um, notifying the claimant of the decision if their disability application has been approved or denied. Um, so this goes through, um, you know, what a client would expect after um, they've done the initial application. Um, next slide. Um, so this slide has um, the Social Security 1-800 um, number um, if a clients are wanting to file by phone um, or the web link if they're filing um, a claim online. Um, they can also go to the office in person. Um, and then, as I said earlier, Social Security will set an appointment for either a phone or an in-person interview. Um, if you're a case manager and wanting to help a client apply, um, it's probably best to apply online. Um, you get a print confirmation of the submission um, and um, can do that online pretty easily. Um, if um, a clients are applying by phone, um, Social Security has um, interpreters that speak different languages or staff that speak Spanish and other languages. Um, if you're assisting a client with an application, you have the option of signing on as the client's authorized um, representative. Um, and that um, is like a specific form known as the um, 1696 form um, that you're allowed to fill out and a client can sign. Um, and then Social Security will work with you as um, the client's representative so that you can help the client navigate the application process. This can be really helpful if a client is unhoused or doesn't have a consistent address or phone number, um, then the client doesn't have to go through the trouble of responding to, you know, the mail, um, because some of that will get relayed to you as um, an authorized representative. Um, so it has a really positive benefit of allowing you to get all the communication between Social Security and your client. So as an authorized representative, you can help your client through the application process. Um, all right, uh, next slide. Um, so the application process includes a number of questionnaires and forms that have to be filled out. Um, so the disability report, which we mentioned earlier, um, details a client's medical history and treatment it's really important for the client to give accurate information about all the hospitals or clinics where they get medical or mental health treatment. Um, so, you know, maybe the client's going to Valley Medical Center, but then also had a recent hospitalization in El Camino or sees another clinic for their private therapy. All of those clinics and treatment facilities should be included including correct addresses and phone numbers. And the reason that's important is DDS uses that clinic contact information um, to request a client's medical and mental health records. If the contact information is not accurate, then DDS will not get the records and that can impact um, a client's um, decision on what they get SSI or SSDI. Um, so there are different forms um, that are required um, for um, filling out and applying for um, benefits. Um, but these forms are required, so it's important clients fill out all these forms and give all the correct information that they have. Um, if they don't, it could negatively impact a client's application for benefits. Um, next slide. Um, the application process also includes some other questionnaires. Um, so an adult function report um, might be something a client could have um, um, another person fill out. Um, it details um, the, um, sorry, there are two forms. There's an adult function report and a third party function report. So the adult function report details a client's activities of daily living. So what are they able to do in a daily, uh, on a daily basis? Are they able to cook meals? meals for themselves, take the trash out, wash the dishes, or do they need help? 
Do they have a caregiver do all of those daily tasks for them? Um, it's important not to overstate a client's ability to do things. Um, on their best day. So like maybe on the ideal day when everything's going well, a client can do all of those daily tasks, like make their bed or get um, their things in order. But, you know, if they're not able to do that on a typical day, um, that's really important to flag, to focus on how difficult things are on the harder days that like maybe the client can't get out of bed, they can't um, get ready on their own, they're not able to leave the house, all of those things like that. There's also a third party function report. Um, these reports might go to a friend or a family member or any other trusted third party that knows the client and their disability. Um, so they would fill it out, um, you know, without the client participating. Um, and case managers can fill out this form. That can be really helpful if you see um, how your disability is impacting your client. Um, you can fill out that third party um, function report if your client um, wants you to. Um, there's also a work history report. Um, this details a client's jobs for the past um, 15 years before the application. Um, you know, the different job titles, where they worked, how much they were earning. Um, and so that's also important so that um, Social Security has a history of a client's, you know, past work um, and um, can know about that. Um, and so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so the consultative exam process. Um, so DDS, the um, Disability Determination Services Department, um, will send clients to what are known as consultative exams. Um, and that's um, what they might do if a client's medical records have insufficient evidence or if there's conflicting evidence in the medical records from different providers. Um, and then um, DDS wants to know whether a person qualifies um, for benefits or has a disability. Um, so consultative examiners are, um, you know, doctors or healthcare staff that aren't the treating physician. So maybe a client has a primary care doctor at Valley Medical Center, but then they're having a consultative examiner from the DDS, who's someone DDS has contracted with to provide a brief one-time examination Unfortunately, the reports that come out of the consultative exams don't really reflect the true range of a client's impairments since it's a one-time thing. The consultative examiner doesn't have the benefit of seeing a client you know, throughout their whole uh, treatment history. Um, so sometimes the consultative exams can be um, negative. They might, you know, overestimate a client's abilities or underestimate the impact of some of the functional impairments. Um, so, uh, you know, as lawyers and advocates, um, when we help our clients with appeals um, and do the appeal process, we might combat some of the inaccuracies in the consultative exam report that don't reflect a client's actual um, abilities um, or inabilities to do um, some of the tasks. Um, and then um, DDS will send consultative exam notices by mail. Um, even though these exams might not be that helpful for a client's application and might, you know, hurt their abilities to qualify, it's really important clients attend these exams. Um, DDS can work with a client to reschedule the appointment if a client misses it. Um, and then if you're an authorized representative, you'll get a notice of the consultative exam as well. Um, and I'll outline where a client has to go and what they have to do. Um, so we have another poll question here. How can a client start an application for SSDI and SSI benefits? Um, so I'll give everyone a little bit of time to fill that out. So the options are calling the office, filing a claim online, visiting a local office, or all of the above. Well, 
Okay, it looks like um, most people are um, filling it out. Um, so yes, um, all of the above was correct. They can um, fill it out online, they can call the office or they can visit a local office in person. Um, so next slide. Uh, so yes, there's another um, uh, poll question. Um, what is the appeal um, level immediately following the reconsideration um, stage? Um, I'm not sure we went over that completely in detail. So if anyone um, has trouble um, with this, that is fine. Um, but um, I'll give everyone a moment. Yeah, and then for people who've forgotten, like there's an initial application after someone is denied the initial application. The second part is the request for reconsideration. Um, and then this question's asking, what do they do after the request for reconsideration? Um, so the answer here is the administrative law judge hearing. Um, and we'll kind of go through the appeal process in a moment. Um, but if someone is denied at the reconsideration stage, they can appeal and ask for an administrative law judge hearing. If they're denied at the ALJ hearing, then they could go um, through um, the other steps being um, appeals council and district court. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. Yes, um, so thank you. And then, yeah, we are running a little bit uh, low on time, so I'm gonna try to move a bit quicker. Um, but this uh, slide outlines the appeal process. Um, so there's an initial decision. This is the first decision they get after um, the initial application. Um, as you can see, not everyone's approved. Only 33% are approved. So the vast majority of clients are denied at the initial um, application stage. Um, then the next part is reconsideration, which just means asking um, the state agency to take another look. Um, here, 13% are approved. So again, not that many. Um, if someone's denied at the request for reconsideration stage, um, the next step is having an, a hearing with an administrative law judge. Um, I also wanted to highlight their lengthy time periods between each of the stages to have a hearing administrative law judge, it can take, you know, over a year sometimes to get that hearing scheduled. But many clients are approved here, about 48% of people that go through this um, stage um, at the hearing are um, approved. And yes, we do um, represent clients at the administrative law judge hearing. Um, and then also if someone's um, Reconsideration stage, they don't have to go on, um, you know, they're getting benefits at the reconsideration. Um, but if they are denied, you know, there might be a reason to appeal or some kind of legal argument. Um, and yeah, it looks like Rachel's answered that on the slide. Um, and then um, if clients are denied at the ALJ hearing, the other um, sequential um, layers of appeal, they could appeal to the appeals council um, or um, a federal judge. Um, that would be kind of the last step. When a federal judge um, looks at it at the district court level, they might grant someone benefits or they might remand it um, back to the uh, a lower stage for the client to um, have another um, look at it. Um, so now we can go on to the next slide. Um, so there are important deadlines to look at in the appeals process. Um, if a client's application is denied, Social Security will send a notice by mail. Um, and the important thing to remember with deadlines is the deadlines are always 60 days and then allowing um, five days for mailing. So it ends up being 65 days. Um, so that deadline applies from the date on the notice. So if Social Security sends your client a notice on January 1st saying that a client's been denied, um, the date to appeal would be 65 days. You have 65 days from January 1st to appeal. Um, clients don't have to wait till the end. They can appeal earlier. Um, and it's best to file an appeal online if possible, um, just so that you know there's a nice record of the appeal. 
If a client appeals in person at the Social Security office, make sure that they get a date stamped copy as proof that they've done the appeal. If a client does miss an appeal deadline, there are exceptions for good cause. Um, so maybe a client was in the hospital and had an emergency, and that's why they missed the deadline. That might you know, qualify as good cause. Um, if your client ever needs to file a late appeal and is wondering how they can do that, you can refer that client to our office for assistance. Next slide. Um, I'm going to actually go on and then we'll do some time for questions at the end, just because the continuity um, review section has some uh, material and um, it can be kind of tricky to go through. Um, so um, continuing disability reviews are done by the Social Security Administration Agency. They happen about every three years. Um, they might be more frequent if a disability um, is expected to improve. Of. Um, and so what a continuing disability review is, is um, Social Security basically looks at um, someone and uh, determines from their medical information, the medical record, things like that, if someone still has a disability. There are some conditions that might improve, like someone might qualify um, for cancer a few years ago, and then they're in remission, and then um, their disability might cease, and they might no longer have um, the physical health symptoms or the conditions to qualify for disability. Um, so that's kind of why Social Security does these um, continuing disability reviews um, to see if someone um, still meets the criteria to qualify for disability. Mm -hmm. so, Asha. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you all hear me? Okay. So um, the next thing is clients, um, so Social Security will notify um, a client by mail that they're reviewing the disability. Um, and then clients will have to fill out questionnaires, similar, um, so like a disability report, function report, some of those same forms um, that they filled out on the initial application. Um, and there is the same uh, levels of appeal. Um, so if a client's denied on um, disability benefits on the continuing disability review, um, they can appeal. They can ask for a request for reconsideration. If they get denied again, they can ask for an ALJ hearing. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this slide um, has some more information about um, continuing disability reviews. So if SSA determines that a client's disability has ended, it will send a notice of a disability cessation notice, which basically means that they think a client's disability is ended, um, they're gonna stop paying SSI or SSDI benefits. Now the deadline for appealing and continuing to receive benefits while the appeal is pending is 15 days. That's a really short amount of time. Um, and it's very important to do everything possible to help the client submit the appeal within these 15 days to avoid a lapse of benefits. Um, they need to do that um, step, the appeal, and to continue to receive benefits. Otherwise, their benefits will stop. Um, good cause for late filing is allowed, but it might result in a lapse of benefits. So um, you can always refer clients in this situation to the Law Foundation if your client needs help with filing a late appeal of disability cessation. Um, otherwise, the deadline for appeal is um, 65 days normally. Um, all right, so um, next slide. Um, so now we have time for um, a few more questions, but um, there's actually, um, I just wanted to quickly go on to the next slide um, just to finish um, the last bit. 
Um, so if you have any concerns about um, application issues, like um, should the client apply for benefits? How do I know when a client's disability began? Um, you know, how far should you request medical records? Things like that. Um, you know, you're always welcome to contact our organization. Um, and the, um, and um, if you go on to the next slide. Um, here's our um, contact information. Um, you can refer clients to the Law Foundation by faxing a referral form, um, by emailing us, um, doing an online referral form, um, or clients can call us um, and walk into our intake hours. Um, and then we also have a medical legal partnership with some clinics and our walk-in times are listed there. Yeah, I'm so sorry we went over time. Um, but thank you. And um, we will have part two of the presentation um, coming up in a couple weeks where there will be more time for questions.